Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi s-salamin a'in min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa al-udwan illa ala al-zalimeen. Wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. So inshallah ta'ala, before we get started tonight, just again a quick announcement. Those of you that were already here, you heard it. Over the next three weeks, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be having short biographies released of the three people that the Prophet ﷺ met on his way to al Madina. It is, of course, the beginning of the new Hijri year. And so we'll actually talk about the biographies of those people who only show up in the capacity of the Hijra. But there isn't much information about them, like Umm Ma'bad radiallahu anha, Suraqa ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, and Burayda radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So over the next three weeks, those will, inshallah ta'ala, be coming out. And then after that, uh, inshallah ta'ala, four weeks from today, we're going to be releasing a documentary about the companions that died in the plague of Amwas. And these were, of course, some of the greatest companions of the Prophet sallallahu Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, and other companions who maybe you didn't know about. Uh, I actually recorded this on site in Jordan. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll release that four weeks from now. And then the week after that, we'll get back to our full biographies, bidnillahi ta'ala. Now, today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be speaking about someone who is very similar to Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu in his entrance to Islam, but who has a beautiful story and a beautiful trajectory. And I want to introduce him in the following way. If there was one person from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who recited the Qur'an so beautifully, that everybody wanted to crowd around him constantly and listen to his recitation, it's this man. In fact, if you think about getting to paradise, may Allah Azza wa make us amongst the people of Al-Jannah, Allahumma Ameen, the companions reminisced and thought about listening to his recitation in paradise. That it is Jannah-like, paradise-like to listen to this man recite the Qur'an. Meaning if you had CDs, or you don't do those anymore, uh, MP3s or whatever it is, if you could download the tracks, and you had one reciter, one favorite Qur'an reciter, if you ask the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, who's your favorite Qur'an reciter? Almost all of them would point to this one man. And there, is, there are many narrations to speak to that. And his name is Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah introduces him. Sahibu Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari al-Tamaymi al-Faqi al-Muqri. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, who was from Tamim, the jurist and the great reciter, and his actual name is Abdullah ibn Qais. Abdullah ibn Qais, and his nickname, similar to Abu Huraira, is what we know him by, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now why do I say he's so similar to Abu Huraira and how he enters into the faith of Islam? Abu Musa was a teenager in Yemen. When he heard from the people that were coming to do trade in Yemen, about the arrival of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as a teenager, he has the dedication and the commitment to go from Yemen to Mecca to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at about 14 or 15 years old with the, ca- with the caravan to see what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like. Who is this man and what is he calling to? And when he meets the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he immediately embraces Islam. So he's one of those who actually technically embraces Islam in Mecca. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends him back to his people to await further orders and he will call his people to Islam. So this young man, unlike Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi, who's the chief of ad the tribe of Abu Huraira, this young man is tasked with going back to his people in Yemen and he's in a, a further part of Yemen from Mecca to call them to Islam. And these were the tribe of Al-Ash'ariyun. So he goes there and he's actually successful. His family converts to Islam, his tribe converts to Islam, and he waits with them and periodically receives instructions on how to pray, on how to dedicate themselves to Islam until the Prophet will give them the permission and give them the command to move to Medina. Now here's what happens with him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He describes the situation. He says that about seven years after Hijrah, so this is around the time of Khaybar, about seven years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa migrated to Medina, he and 50 of his tribe, they board a ship 
from the southern part of Yemen, and they're going to make their way up to Al Madinah. So they get on a boat. I don't know if you want to call it a ship or a boat, you know, but they get on a boat and they decide that they're going to make their way up to Al Madinah. And this is what he describes. He says, Kharajna min al Yemen, fi bidu'in wa khamsina min qawmi, wa nahnu thalatha tu ikhwa. He said, We went out as 50, and we were three brothers. Ana wa Abu Ruhm wa Abu Amr. Where's Abu Amr, by the way? Is he here? Oh, he's not here. So someone can say we mentioned him finally, right? So Abu Ruhm and Abu Amr are the brothers of Abu Musa, literally his siblings. So he says, We're three siblings. I called my brothers to Islam, they embraced Islam. And I am the youngest of the three, and we made our way out to Al Madinah. And in one, uh, by the way, recorded narration, his mother also comes with him. So his father was not alive, his mother comes with him. And his mother has a very interesting name. Her name is Dhabya, Dhabya bint Wahab. Dhabya bint Wahab. So she would actually go on to die in Medina as a Muslim, and she's buried in Al Baqir as well. So it's the family, and they're going out. Now I want you to look at this map for a moment, inshallah ta'ala. This is a modern map. There was no Ethiopia back then. There was no Saudi Arabia. There was Yemen, but it wasn't exactly along those borders. But at least it'll give you a picture, inshallah ta'ala. So Abu Musa says we're from the southern part of Al Yemen. And we get on this boat and we start to make our way up to Al Madinah. Now Madinah is north of Mecca. So it's going to take you some time to pass through past Jeddah and then get to Al Madinah, right? At the, at the, the northern part of, of what is now Saudi Arabia, okay? And he says that the weather got so bad that the winds kept on blowing us in one direction, okay? So what ends up happening is they end up in what is now the coast of Ethiopia and Eritrea, which back then was called what? Does anyone remember? Habasha, Abyssinia. Right? Abyssinia, which is the first place that the Muslims fled persecution to. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ fled persecution to. So basically, they find their boat steers off at the coast of Habasha. So he says that we found ourselves in the presence of an Najashi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the righteous ruler of Abyssinia, which is now Ethiopia, who had embraced Islam and who had given refuge to the early Muslims, to the followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And they had Ja'far and his companions. Now SubhanAllah, I always wondered why they took this trip to Ethiopia first. And Ibn Hajar Rahimullah actually writes in some detail about the weather being the cause of it. And of course, Allah is the one who controls the weather. So imagine the coincidence of getting out on the water and thinking you're going to Medina. And then the wind keeps on pushing you in a way and the conditions keep on pushing you in a way that you end up in Abyssinia where there's a group of the companions of the Prophet So what's happening in Abyssinia is that the Sahaba in Abyssinia are also preparing to make Hijrah to Medina. They're getting ready to make their migration to Medina as well. Now Najashi, and some of you might have forgotten this, it's been a long time since we spoke about him. Najashi anhu, knew that his political situation was always a little unstable. So what he did was he actually prepared some boats for Ja'far and the companions, and he said, if anything ever happens to me, these are yours, get on the boat and go. Okay, so he already had their boats prepared for them to make their way out of Abyssinia because the only reason the Muslims were protected in a Christian kingdom was because he had secretly embraced Islam and he was protecting them. So Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he meets Abu Musa and these people that are coming from Yemen to make their way to Medina, he says to them, inna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ba'athana ha huna, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent us here uh, to stay, wa amarana bil iqamati fa'aqimu ma'ana, and he told us to stay here until Allah makes a way out for us, so stay with us. So they stayed with them until they all boarded these two boats together to make their way to Al Madinah together. So you see now what's going to happen. We're going to Medina, and I want you to think about being on a boat, and the person that's going to receive you at the dock is the Prophet. This is like the, the reverse of the Hijrah, right? Where the Prophet is coming to Medina, and everyone's waiting in the trees for the Prophet to arrive. You have two boatloads of people, some of them like Ja'far, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, the family of the Prophet ﷺ, some of the best companions who haven't seen him for years, and you have this group of people that are super excited to meet the Prophet ﷺ for the first time, 
and they're on these two boats together, and the Prophet ﷺ was excited about the people that were coming with Abu Musa. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say to the companions? He said to the companions in Medina, يَقْدَمُ عَلَيْكُمْ غَدًا قَوْمٌ هُمْ أَرَقُّ قُلُوبًا لِلْإِسْلَامِ مِنْكُمْ There's a group of people that are coming tomorrow, and their hearts are even softer, their hearts are even more attached to Islam than you. They've never met me, they didn't spend all this time in Medina, but when they show up, you're going to see the love that these people have for faith, even though they didn't have your experience. And SubhanAllah, Abu Musa says that as we were getting close to the coast of, uh, you know, where we were going to meet the Prophet Wasallam, the people on the boat started to sing غَدًا نَلْقَ الْأَحِبَّةِ مُحَمَّدًا وَحِزْبًا غَدًا نَلْقَ الْأَحِبَّةِ مُحَمَّدًا وَحِزْبًا Tomorrow we will meet our beloved ones, Muhammad وسلم, and his companions. So imagine being on that boat and the anticipation of meeting the Prophet وسلم, and the people are singing غَدًا نَلْقَ الْأَحِبَّةِ مُحَمَّدًا وَحِزْبًا which was of course the famous statement of Bilal radiallahu anhu when he was dying Tomorrow we will meet our loved ones, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his companions. And he says, and so when we got to al Medina, when we got down, we started to greet the companions. And in fact, the narration says that this was the first time that Al-Musafa'a, the shaking hands, was legislated as a group because they're, they're introducing themselves to the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam for the first time. And they're meeting the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam for the first time. And you can imagine the joy in Medina. They just thwarted off one of the worst attacks in Khaybar. So they've just solidified the situation in Medina. And now you have this group of companions that haven't been seen since Mecca. And you have this group of new companions that are coming from the southern tip of Yemen to meet the Prophet Wasallam. And the Prophet Wasallam said they are even closer to Islam than the people that have been here the entire time. And he sees Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he kissed Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu on the forehead and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ma adri bi ayyuhuma ana afrah bi qudumi Ja'far am bi fathi Khaybar I don't know which is giving me more joy the opening of Khaybar or the coming of Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu and so this is the joy that is taking place in Medina and this is an episode in the seerah that's really really interesting because you suddenly have in one day the coming of Ja'far, you have Abu Musa and his people, and guess who else showed up at that time? Abu Hurairah. Remember Abu Hurairah anhu said, I showed up at Fajr on the day of Khaybar, and he actually remembered what the Prophet ﷺ recited that day in Salatul Fajr. And one of the things that the scholars mention is look at how beautiful this entire episode is. Because the ship went left, Right? Because it didn't go straight to Al-Madina, these people took on the great reward of being from Ashab al-Hijratain, the people of the two migrations. The people of the two migrations who are a higher rank than those who fled with their faith one time. The people who fled to Abyssinia and the people who fled to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ said to Al-Ash'ariyoon, that group of people, لَكُمُ الْهِجْرَةُ مَرَّتَيْنْ هَاجَرْتُمْ إِلَى النَّجَاشِ وَهَاجَرْتُمْ إِلَيَّ you have the reward of two migrations, the migration to Al-Najashi radiallahu ta'ala anhu as well as the migration to me here in al Madina. So this is Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his tribe of Al-Ash'ariyun. Now, uh, Abu Musa also says that the Prophet sallallahu gave the people of the two ships or the two boats a share of the spoils of Khaybar, even though they didn't attend Khaybar. And that was also a means of solidifying their intention to be with the Prophet ﷺ, even in his most difficult moments. And so in this mini hijrah, all over again, you now have a new community in Medina. Now, SubhanAllah, this tribe will be famous. And by the way, when I say al-Ash'ariyun, I'm not talking about a madhab, all right? So if, in case some of you mix that up, I'm talking about a tribe literally at the time. Al-Ash'ariyun, come to the Prophet ﷺ and they say, can you read the Qur'an to us? Okay, can you read the Qur'an to us? And the Prophet ﷺ reads the Qur'an to them and they all start to cry. Now, there's a later incident, subhanAllah, that's very much so connected to this, which is in the time of Abu Bakr anhu, when a group of people came from Yemen to embrace Islam 
and I think it was in Amal Wafud, in the year of the delegation, or later on, but Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said that they asked for the Qur'an to be recited to them, and when the Qur'an was recited to them, they started to cry right away, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said the famous words, هَكَذَا كُنَّا قَبْلَ أَنْ قَصَّتْ قُلُوبُنَا That's how we used to be before our hearts became hard. What did he mean by that? The beauty of the person who, who, who hears the Qur'an the first time being recited who connects to it, who opens it and reads it for the very first time. We got our brother Demario, mashallah, who came back and you were talking about reading the Qur'an and you can't stop thinking about it. We used to be like that when our hearts were a little softer like yours and we pray that our hearts can also be soft and, and united as well. But that's, that was the feeling Abu Bakr said, you know, I remember when we used to be like that. I remember when our hearts used to be soft, when we used to hear the Qur'an for the very first time. And this is basically what ends up becoming their reputation. Abu Musa's reputation as an individual and this tribe as a whole was the Qur'an. In one narration, when the ayah was recited, فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهِ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ That if you turn back on this mission, Allah will bring about a people that love Him and that are beloved to Him. The Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, هُمْ قَوْمُكَ يَا أَبَى مُوسَى This is your people, O Abu Musa. Now we know that the Prophet ﷺ also said this to Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right? And so that shows you that the verse applies to multiple contexts. The point is, is that if the people who initially have the Qur'an gifted to them don't take advantage of it and they don't connect to it in a proper way, Allah can bring about a different people that will connect to it in a way that it should be connected to. And so the Prophet ﷺ was praising the tribe of Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu in this regard. And here in, there's a beautiful narration as well. So now you're living in Medina and you're amongst this group of people. And imagine walking the streets of Medina at night and hearing the Qur'an being recited from the different homes. The people up at night praying Qiyamul and reciting the Qur'an. And listen to what the Prophet وسلم, says. He says in this an authentic hadith, قَالَ إِنِّي لَأَعْرِفُ أَصْوَاتَ رُفْقَةِ الْأَشْعَرِيِّينَ بِالْقُرْآنِ The Prophet ﷺ said, I know the voices of the Ash'ariyeen, the tribe of Abu Musa, with their Qur'an, حِينَ يَدْخُلُونَ بِاللَّيْلِ Whenever they, they stand up at night. I know their voices at night when they stand up to recite the Qur'an. وَأَعْرِفُ مَنَازِلَهُمْ مِنْ أَصْوَاتِهِمْ بِالْقُرْآنِ بِاللَّيْلِ I know which houses they live in, because of the Qur'an that comes from their houses at night. وَإِن كُنْتُ لَمْ أَرَى مَنَازِلَهُمْ حِينَ نَزَلُوا بِالنَّهَارِ I don't see where they go in the daytime. Even if I don't know where they actually live, and even if I never saw them enter their home in the daytime, when I walk the streets at night, I know exactly which houses belong to the tribe of Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu because of the way that they recite the Qur'an. Imagine being that tribe, those, the, those 50 or so people that are so distinguished that the Prophet ﷺ walks around and he says, that's one of them, that's one of them, that's one of them, because of the distinct way they recite the Qur'an uh, at night. And in one narration, they're praised if the uh, Ash'ariyun go out on an expedition and they have only a little bit of food amongst them, then they take one cloth and they divide it equally amongst themselves. That they had these certain attributes, these characteristics that the Prophet ﷺ loved about them, their charity, their love for the Qur'an, the way that they used to protect one another. He loved this about them Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he would praise them in this way. So the head of these people is this man, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a teenager when he embraced Islam. And I actually want to mention his physical appearance for a reason. Because you find that the companion's physical appearance, when it's mentioned in certain ways, there's usually some meaning, some reason why the, the, the mention is there. Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu is described as the following, qasiran khafif al-jism. He was very short and he was very skinny. Why is that important? He didn't have this super physical imposing presence. That's not what made him the giant that he's going to become amongst the companions. Just like, Abu, uh, just like Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, did not have a giant physical imposing presence. But he's going to become that man that if he's in a gathering, all of the companions turn towards him right away. And so a lot of the things that were superficial about that generation, about, not about that generation, about that society before Islam, all of that's being wiped out, right? And so when they mentioned this, that look, he wasn't someone who was 
physically very big. He didn't have an imposing presence. But the man automatically commanded the entire gathering when he walked in, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And what was the thing that made him so distinguished? That voice. His voice with the Qur'an. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates that one time I was walking with the Prophet sallallahu at night in the streets. And the Prophet sallallahu stopped at a house and he started to listen to the Qur'an being recited from that house. And he told Aisha radiallahu anha, come here and listen with me. So Aisha says, I came and I listened with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they listened for a while. Imagine the Prophet sallallahu at your door listening to your read Qur'an at night. And his pleasure with that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left at night and afterwards Abu Musa was told, you know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was listening to you read Qur'an last night and he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قَالَ لَوْ لَكَ تَحْبِيرًا the, oh, Prophet of Allah, if I would have known, right, then he would have given the Prophet وسلم, a special sitting, he would have given him a special type of voice, I would have made it a lot better, and I would have made it only for you if I would have known that you were there listening to my voice. But the Prophet وسلم, uh, instead saw something else special. There was a reason why the Prophet وسلم, did not tell him that he was there. Buraida radiallahu ta'ala anhu has another narration. He says that one time, we, I went out at night and I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bab al-Masjid. He was at the door of the Masjid. And Ida Rajrun Yusalli, there was someone inside the Masjid that was praying. Now the Prophet Sallallahu's house was right next to the Masjid. So here the Prophet Sallallahu is at the door and he's listening to someone read the Quran in the Masjid. So the Prophet Sallallahu looked at me. Qala Ya Buraida, at Yurai. Do you think he's showing off? Do you think that man's showing off? I mean, think about the scene, right? The Prophet ﷺ is at the door of the masjid and he's listening to someone who's praying inside the masjid and he's reading the Qur'an out loud in a beautiful voice and he's got a flow to it. He has that beautiful tartil, that beautiful recitation. So he says, Buraida, you think he's showing off? Do you think he's doing this just because of me? And Buraida said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Bal huwa mu'minun munib. Rather, he is a believer, a repentant one, one who turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. And he said, لَقَدْ أُعْطِيَ مِزْمَارًا مِنْ مَزَامِيرِ آلِ Dawood." And this was the famous statement of the Prophet وسلم, about Abu Musa. He has been given one of the instruments of the family of David. One of the instruments of the family of David. Now I'm going to talk about that for uh, a moment, inshaAllah ta'ala, and then we'll get back to the story. What does it mean when the Prophet وسلم, said he has been given one of the instruments Mizmar is literally a flute, right? The Dawood Islam used to play a flute. What does that mean? Dawood Islam, David had a beautiful voice. And Allah gave him the Psalms and he used to sing the Psalms. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us about how beautiful his voice was? What used to glorify Allah with David, with Dawood Islam? The mountains the birds, everything used to sing along with him in the sense of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the revelation that came to Dawood alayhi salam. And in Jannah, inshaAllah ta'ala, we will hear the tasbih of Dawood alayhi salam, the recitation of Dawood alayhi salam. And the Prophet sallallahu is saying about Abu Musa that you have a voice like the voices of the family of Dawood alayhi salam. You've been given something extremely special, but he's been given it with the Qur'an. Not the Psalms, but with the Qur'an. And he would say that frequently about him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. May Allah allow us to hear that voice in al-Jannah. Allahumma ameen. So the Prophet ﷺ said that about him. And as Abu Musa is reciting the Qur'an, he then starts to make dua. He doesn't know that the Prophet ﷺ is there and he starts to make dua. And he says, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anni ashhadu annaka Allah la ilaha illa ant al-ahadu samad alladhi lam yalid wa lam yulad. So it's a very famous dua that you might have heard, by the way, in Qunut. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anni ashhadu annaka Allah, la ilaha illa ant, al ahadu samad, al ladhi lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakunahu kufuan ahad. Oh Allah, I ask you, bearing witness that you are Allah, there is no God but you, al ahad, the one, al samad. الَّذِي لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ The self-sufficient who has not begotten, nor was he begotten. And there is nothing comparable to him 
and the Prophet وسلم, swore by Allah that he had asked Allah with the name that if Allah that if a person asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a way that Allah will certainly answer that person's dua. So Buraida says, Can I go tell him, Ya Rasulullah, about what happened? And the Prophet وسلم, said, You can tell him. So he said, Afterwards I went to him and I told him what happened. فَقَالَ لَا تَزَالُ لِي صَدِيقًا He said, and you will remain a friend forever, right? Like this, like the person who comes to me and gives me this type of good news that the Prophet ﷺ said, your dua was answered last night. Is a very special friend, is a very special person uh, to keep with you. And this was his voice, radiallahu anhu, in his position, his closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Uthman al-Nahdi, radiallahu anhu, says, مَا سَمِعْتُ مِزْمَارًا وَلَا تُنْبُورًا وَلَا صَنْجًا أحسن من صوت أبي موسى الأشعري إن كان ليصلي بنا فنود أنه قرأ البقرة من حسن صوته. He said that I've never heard any instrument, a flute, a drum, any instrument that's ever been made in history that sounded sweeter than the voice of Abu Musa when he used to lead us in salah. We used to wish that he would read Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Like when Sheikh Yasser leads you, right? You guys need to tell him. Can you read Surah Al-Baqarah on Isha tonight, right? <laughs> But we used to wish that he would read Surah Al-Baqarah because of how beautiful his voice was. I mean, imagine, subhanAllah, again, the Qari that the Sahaba wished that they could pray behind and that they want to hear over and over and over again. Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that one night Abu Musa was reciting and the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out yastami'na li qira'atihi to hear the recitation of Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this is kind of a tradition now that you're going to see happening throughout his entire life. Anywhere Abu Musa goes, he's that Qari that everyone wants to listen to. Everyone wants to come around. And the scholars say, SubhanAllah, the Prophet وسلم, particularly absolved him from what? Riya, from showing off. Because the Prophet وسلم, mentioned that towards the end of times, there will be plentiful reciters. And it is of the things that can plague a person who is a Qari, is Riya. And that's why you find entire chapters that are dedicated to it, showing off and ostentation and boasting, right? And the Prophet ﷺ particularly says, this man is not reciting for people. This man is reciting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This man reads the Qur'an that way because he loves Allah, because he's been given something special from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are so many different narrations about this that we'll get to uh, when it comes to other people as well. So Abu Musa radiallahu anhu talks about some of his incidents with the Prophet ﷺ that are outside of the capacity, particularly when it comes to the recitation. He mentions that the Prophet ﷺ sent myself and my brothers uh, after Hunayn uh, with Jaysi al Tas. So they went out, and this is a couple of years after they came and they joined the Prophet ﷺ. And he and his brother went out and they fought in this particular battalion. And he says that my brother Abu Amr laqiya Duraid ibn al Simma. That my brother Abu Amr. Uh, came into combat with Duraid. And he says, so Duraid was killed, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hazam Allah ashaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed that army, uh, the opponents. But he says that my brother, Aba Amr al-Ash'ari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was struck by an arrow. So he said that when he fell by that arrow, and I'm paraphrasing the story, when he fell by that uh, arrow, he said, can you remove it from me? So he was on the ground, and the arrow was deep inside of him. So he said that I went ahead and I removed the arrow and obviously what ended up happening was that the blood was flowing too quickly. So basically he says that my brother Abu Amr al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu was dying and listen to what he said to me. He said, يَا بْنَ أَخِي انطلق إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَأَقْرِئْ مِنِّي فَأَقْرِئْ هُمْ مِنِّي السَّلَامِ when you go to the Prophet ﷺ, give him salam from me. I'm not going to get to go back to the Prophet ﷺ. So when you go to the Prophet ﷺ, give him my salam. وَقُلْ لَهُ يَسْتَغْفِرْ لِي And ask him to seek forgiveness for me. So when you get back to the Prophet ﷺ, tell him what happened, give him my greeting, and ask him to seek forgiveness for me. And so he says that afterwards, uh, he passed away. And he said, when I came to the Prophet وسلم, I told the Prophet وسلم, exactly what happened. فَقَامَ عَلِيهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ وَتَوَضَّأَ The Prophet وسلم, got up and he made wudu. ثُمَّ رَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ And then the Prophet وسلم, 
uh, raised his hands and he said, Allahumma ghfir li Ubaid Abi Amir. Oh Allah, forgive Ubaid Abi Amir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he said, Hatta ra'aytu bayada ibtayhi, until I saw the, uh, his, his armpits, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the, the whiteness of his armpits, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning he was raising his hands to the sky, making dua for his brother. And that's where he seized an opportunity. He said, and O Messenger of Allah, what about Abu Musa? Like, can I get some of this dua as well <laughs> that you're making for my brother? And he says, Allahumma ja'alhu, about Abu Musa, Allahumma ja'alhu yawm al-qiyamati fawqa kathir min khalqik. Oh Allah, I'm sorry, he made this dua for his brother. Oh Allah, make him on the day of judgment above many of your creation. And then he said about Abu Musa, Allahumma khfir li abdillah ibn Qais, dhambahu wa adkhilhu yawm al-qiyamati mudkhalan karima. Oh Allah, forgive Abdullah ibn Qais, which is Abu Musa's name, all of his sins and enter him on the day of judgment or grant him on the day of judgment a high and praiseworthy station. And so you find that he's one of those companions who had the Prophet ﷺ make dua for him, supplicate for him by name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive all of his sins and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would elevate him on the day of judgment. He also narrates uh, a story of a glad tidings that took place around uh, what is most likely Fatah Mecca, most likely the opening of Mecca. He says that we were in Ja'rana, which is an area outside of Mecca. And he says, a Arabi man came, a Bedouin man came. And the Bedouins had this way of talking where they were just straight to the point. And sometimes they didn't really understand like the, the adab, the manners that they were supposed to have with the Prophet So he said to the Prophet Alla tunji zuri ma wa'atani? Are you going to give me what you promised me now? We became Muslim. So when does the promise happen? When does it all come true? So the Prophet ﷺ told him, Abshir, glad tidings. And listen to what he said. Qala qad min al -bushra. Ya Rasulullah, you've given a lot of glad tidings. Like, all right, I'm ready for this to start happening, right? So the Prophet ﷺ turned to Abu Musa and Bilal. Abu Musa and Bilal. And he said, Inna hadha qad radd al -bushra. He said that this person just turned away the glad tidings. So he said, come close to me. Both of you come close to me. So Abu Musa and Bilal came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa da'a bi qadah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi called for a container. He washed his hands, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He washed his face uh, within it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, mixed his saliva with it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he told them, ashriba minhu, to drink from it. Wa afriga ala ru'usikuma. And go ahead and put some of it on your heads as well. Pour it on your heads and on your, uh, on your limbs as well. And so they did so, and obviously the blessing that came from that was significant. We know, we know this from the Prophet Sallallahu that this was one of his miracles as a Prophet of Allah, that these things will be blessed through him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha called out, and she said that the Prophet Sallallahu has sufficiently uh, blessed the two of you. So the Prophet Sallallahu sent some of that water to Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha as well. So he narrates that incident as well. And then finally, one more, uh, which is specifically tied to the other companions, but it kind of tells you about the relationship that he's going to have with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, in Medina. He says that one day, خَرَجْتُ أُرِيدُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ فَوَجَدْتُهُ قَدْ سَلَكَ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ فَتَبِعْتُهُ فَوَجَدْتُهُ He said that I went out one day looking for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I came to know that the Prophet ﷺ had kind of left everyone and he went to these gardens. So this was very interesting because every day if you wanted to find the Prophet ﷺ, you looked for him in the masjid, couldn't find him in the masjid, you looked for him in the baqir, in the graveyard, you looked for him in the marketplace, and no one could find the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Musa says, I'm going around, I'm looking for the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, I found the Prophet ﷺ in this garden and he was sitting in a well known as Bi'r Aris, the well of Aris. So this is a famous story and you can actually go to the location of Bi'r Aris in Medina today. And listen, look, look, listen to the scene. He said that I saw the Prophet ﷺ sitting alone in this well and he had his, uh, his uh, shalwar lifted up sallallahu alayhi wasallam to where his legs were exposed and he was dangling his feet in the well sallallahu alayhi wasallam sitting all by himself. Now Abu Musa knows, like, I just got really, really lucky finding the Prophet Sallallahu you know, in this particular situation. So he said, so I told myself, 
I'm going to be the one to guard the Prophet today. I'm going to appoint myself as his guard today. So I stood in front of the garden and I said to myself that I'm going to be the one that protects the Prophet today. I'm going to let him have his time, let him have his peace of mind, his dhikr. The Prophet is sitting alone in this garden, doesn't want to be bothered today. So he said, so I stood there. And who comes first? Abu Bakr. So you might have heard the story, but not through the lens of Abu Musa. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu finds the Prophet and Abu Musa says, hold on, let me go ask him. So I go to the Prophet because I appointed myself as his guard right now, right? And I said that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is here. The Prophet said, give him permission and give him the glad tidings of paradise as well. So Abu Musa goes and he tells Abu Bakr, go ahead and come in and you have the glad tidings of Jannah and he praises Allah for that glad tidings of paradise. And he goes and he sits right next to the Prophet He lifts up his pants and he starts to dangle his legs in the well also. SubhanAllah, how much we would have loved to be in that particular gathering, right? In that particular sitting. So Abu Musa says, I came back out and I stood there. And who comes next? Of course, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. It's only natural. And Umar radiallahu anhu asks me, Abu Musa, permission to come in and sit. So I go to the Prophet ﷺ and I tell the Prophet ﷺ what happened. And the Prophet وسلم, he says, go ahead and give him permission and give him the glad tidings of Jannah. May Allah give you the glad tidings of Jannah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Allahumma Ameen. It's okay, don't. <laughs> May Allah give you the glad tidings of Jannah. You want to sit here, Ammu? Here, you can sit right here. Asalaamu Alaikum. What's your name? Yusuf. Everyone say, May Allah grant Yusuf Jannah and his parents. Allahumma Ameen. So the Prophet وسلم, says, let him in and give him the glad tidings of Jannah. So Abu Musa, here's what he says next. He says, at that point I said to myself, I hope the next guy that comes is my brother. Because he knows what's happening. The Prophet is giving people the glad tidings of Jannah. So whoever is blessed enough to find this place is going to get the glad tidings of Jannah. And the Prophet is sitting in this well and he's got Abu Bakr and Umar next to him and they're dangling their feet in the well. And the third person that comes is who? Uthman radiallahu ta'ala It's so natural and blessed. So I come to the Prophet I say it's Uthman ibn Affan, he's asking permission. The Prophet says, give him the glad tidings of Jannah, but ala balwa tusibuhu, with the tragedy that's going to happen to him. It's not going to be easy for him. Right? He's going to be assassinated. Something bad's going to happen to him. And so Abu Musa comes back and he gives Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu that glad tidings, but also that it would be after a difficulty, a tragedy that you would have to endure. And Uthman radiallahu anhu praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and expresses, affirms his patience. And he comes and he sits across from the Prophet sallallahu and Abu Bakr and Umar. And of course, as Sa'id ibn Jubayr who narrates this from Abu Musa, he says that subhanAllah, this was the way that they're buried. Like the Prophet sallallahu was buried next to Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman was not allowed to be buried next to them. And so Uthman is in al baqir but he's directly facing them, even though he's not next to them. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Abu Musa was that person who used to go out in search of the Prophet وسلم, and who was able to witness this beautiful uh, situation that took place and to give the Prophet to give Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman those glad tidings. We also find in multiple narrations the praise of Abu Musa's modesty and his charity. Now, his haya, his modesty, is something that the, that the Sahaba used to praise. They said that he used to wear extra uh, clothes, that he used to be very you know, careful in terms of exposing himself, makhafatan uh, and yatakashaf, out of fear that his awrah would be exposed, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and that this was something that was praiseworthy, that he was a very modest man, a very humble man. Uh, he used to wear some of the uh, most humble of clothes, the most coarse of clothes, and of course, those that were closest to the Prophet sallallahu they embraced a life of poverty because the Prophet ﷺ lived a life of poverty. So if you wanted to be around the Prophet ﷺ all the time, you likely were going to live in his most difficult conditions as well. And that's one of the things that Abu Musa uh, says. He says, لَوْ رَأَيْتَنَا وَنَحْنُ نَخْرُجُ مَعْ نَبِيِّنَا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ إِذْ أَصَابَتْنَا السَّمَاءِ He said, if you were with us, he's telling his son, if you would have seen us that day that we were walking, I and the Prophet ﷺ, and it started to rain on us, and because of the condition of their clothes, the wool that they were wearing, he says that the smell of that wool started to come out. 
and that was a description of the hardship that they lived in being around the Prophet ﷺ who chose not to live like a king but who chose instead to live a life of poverty. He's also the one that narrates. So by the way, if you read in a hadith, Abdullah ibn Qais, it's Abu Musa, and sometimes he's referred to as Abdullah ibn Qais. He's also the one that narrates a hadith that we benefit from tremendously today, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Abdullah ibn Qais, Ala adulluka ala karimatin min kunuz al jannah. O oh, Abdullah ibn Qais, shall I tell you about one of the treasures of the treasures of paradise? What is the dhikr that is a treasure of the treasures of paradise? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power, no capability except that which is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we get it from Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu as he narrates this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a personal way that as you embrace this life of hardship being around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know that what the Prophet ﷺ is promising you is far greater than anything of this world. His status amongst the companions was that he was a faqih. Are you looking for your dad? He's not in trouble, by the way. Is your dad here? Your mom? Where's your mom? I promise you're not in trouble. <laughs> I'm just worried about him. There's your mom. Is that your mom? Okay. Yusuf was found by his mom, alhamdulillah. Matches the name. And don't worry about it. He, he got a lot of dua, alhamdulillah, from everybody. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. Inshallah ta'ala and bless you as well. So his status amongst the companions is he's a hafiz. And remember, it wasn't that common or as common as we think for someone to memorize the entirety of the Qur'an as it's coming down to the Prophet He was one of those who read to the Prophet And he was considered aqra'u ahlil basra. When he moves to Basra in Iraq, he's considered the greatest reciter amongst them. And he was also considered a jurist. He was considered a faqih, a jurist and a judge. And it is rare to find those things combined in one person, right? And subhanAllah, when you think about the great names that are mentioned, uh, perhaps his name is not always mentioned in the rank of those qula, of those judges, of those jurists in the masjid of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. In one narration, Abu al-Bukhtari uh, says that we asked Ali radiAllahu ta'ala anhu, about the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Ali radiallahu anhu said, "An ayyihim tas'aluni, which ones of them are you asking me about?" So first they said Ibn Mas'ud. So he said, "Ali al Quran wa Sunnah." So he knew the Quran and he knew the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa kafa bihi ilma, like the knowledge that he had was absolutely incredible. There was not many, there were not many people that reached the rank of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu taala anhu. And so they then went on and they said, what about Abu Musa? So he mentioned that uh, fil ilmi sibgha. That it's, it's like a person, subhanAllah, that was completely immersed in knowledge. And this is something that's obviously very beautiful about him. And they went on to ask him about some of the other companions of the Prophet SallAllahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. There are other narrations of Aswad ibn Yazid. He said, Lam ara bil kufati a'lama min Ali wa Abi Musa. I did not find anyone in Kufa and Iraq that was more knowledgeable than Ali and then Abu Musa. Masruq radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Kan al qudaa'u fi sahabati. Or he says that there were, there were six amongst the companions that were considered from the qudaa, from the judges. Qala Umar wa Ali wa Ibn Mas'ud wa Ubay wa Zayd wa Abi Musa. So again, Umar, Ali, Ibn Mas'ud, Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Zayd ibn Thabit and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Safwan ibn Sulaym says لم يكن يفتي في المسجد زمن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم غير هؤلاء عمر وعلي ومعاذ وأبي وأبي موسى He says that no one used to give fatwa in the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, during his time like these four people Umar and Ali and Mu'adh ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he's considered one of the muftis, one of the jurists of the companions as well. Now the other things that we take from him radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the sunnah of tahniq, the sunnah of having uh, the Prophet sallallahu uh, basically rub the date on top of the mouth and then give it to the child. And Imam an nawi rahimahullah, I'm sorry, Imam Muslim rahimahullah puts this under the chapter bab, istihbab tahniq al-mawludi uh, that the, the recommendation or the blessing of having the tahniq done of a child 
by someone who is righteous, uh, who would do the tahnik, and the, uh, the, the recommendation to name your children after the prophets of Allah, after Abdullah or Ibrahim, and other names of the prophets. Why? Because Abu Musa says that a child was born to me, and I brought him to the Prophet ﷺ when he was born to me, and he gave him the name of what? Not Musa, actually Ibrahim. So his first child was actually Ibrahim. You know, sometimes uh, a child is given a name when they're younger or someone takes on a name because they expect that they're going to name their oldest son and it kind of sticks that way. But the Prophet ﷺ actually named his first son Ibrahim. And the Prophet ﷺ took a date and he did tahniq with it ﷺ. He rubbed it on his mouth ﷺ on the upper palate and he did so with the child as well. So Abu Musa is the one who encounters this with his child uh, Ibrahim and he would go on to have uh, children Ibrahim, Musa. Uh, the child that would narrate from him most was a child named Abi Burda and Abu Bakr ibn Abi Musa. So these were his four sons. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. Who would all go on to become narrators from Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now he narrates a lot of ahadith. A lot of them have to do with the Quran. And if you're a half of you can relate to these ahadith in particular. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ta'ahadu al-Qur'an. Ta'ahadu al-Qur'an is, uh, means that you keep on refreshing your covenant with the Qur'an. Like it's not something you just read every once in a while. Ta'ahadu al-Qur'an. And he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي That I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul, that the Qur'an escapes a person the way that camels escape the flock. If you don't tie your camel, it will run away. If you don't tie the Qur'an, it's going to get away from you. And so he's saying, Ta'ahadu al-Qur'an, and Abu Musa is the one who narrates this from the Prophet ﷺ, this very famous example, to constantly renew your covenant with it. And the greatest way to renew your covenant with it is to recite it in your qiyam, to recite it at night. He also narrates the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ رَبَّهُ وَالَّذِي لَا يَذْكُرُ مَثَلُ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيِّتُ that the, the example of the one who remembers Allah and the one who does not remember Allah is like the example of the one who is alive and the example of one who is dead. So he narrates this set of ahadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the Prophet Sallallahu sent him away from Medina before he passes away. Now I want you to think about this, and this is something that from a historical perspective shows you a little bit of the, the, the strategy and the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The best person to go back to a people is someone that came from them in the first place, right? To go back to a people and to, and to call them to Islam. And Abu Musa radiallahu anhu, and it's a lengthy narration, he says that a group of Ash'ariyun came to the Prophet and they were asking the Prophet for positions. Obviously, they're not doing it from a place of insincerity. They're asking the Prophet to appoint them in different places. And he said that, it's as if I'm looking at the Prophet ﷺ right now and he was brushing his teeth with the siwak وسلم, as he was listening to them. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he stopped using the siwak and he said that we do not appoint those who ask for it, but he says, Ya Aba Musa, as for you, O Abu Musa, ila al Yemen. I'm sending you back to Yemen. I'm sending you back to Yemen. So Abu Musa had accepted Islam as a teenager in Mecca, gone back to Yemen. Now he came to Medina, he'd lived with the Prophet ﷺ, he had been one of his greatest companions, and now the Prophet ﷺ is sending him back to Al-Yemen. Now who else did the Prophet ﷺ famously send to Yemen? In fact, the most famous departure, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. If you read the chapter of Bukhari, you'll see the chapter of sending Mu'adh and Abu Musa. So they were actually both sent to Yemen. And this was common for the Prophet ﷺ to send two companions to a place. And we'll see that when the Prophet ﷺ sent the companions to, uh, or rather when uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, for example, sent the army to Persia, that it was Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, and then Salman al-Farisi, who's from the people, right? A Persian like them. So the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, and he's certainly the one who's in charge. And he sent as well Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who is from the people, who understands their culture, and in fact, in the narration of Abu Musa, Abu Musa is asking the Prophet ﷺ about the different things that the people of Yemen do. So he's, he's explaining to the Prophet ﷺ a particular type of drink that the people drink over there. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, this is khamar, this is an intoxicant. 
And he's explaining to the Prophet Sallallahu some of the games that they play. And the Prophet Sallallahu is likening this to gambling, right? So he's asking the Prophet Sallallahu very specific things now because the Sharia is solidified about how the people of Yemen are supposed to live their lives now, how they're supposed to interact with this. And the Prophet Sallallahu gave advice to Mu'adh that we know, which is a long conversation and one of the most emotional conversations that we find in the seerah as he's sending him off to Yemen. And then he gives advice to Abu Musa. Now, some of the things that he says to Mu'adh, he says to Mu'adh and Abu Musa together. So for example, uh, Abu Musa narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, yassira wa la tu'assira wa bashira wa la tunaffira. Right? So give people glad tidings. Don't run them away. Be lenient with the people. Be easy with the people. Be gentle with the people. Don't be harsh on them, right? So giving him a methodology of how he is supposed to treat the people of Yemen. And then you have some of the specifics to how the people of Yemen should now interact with the legislation because the first time Abu Musa came to a small tribe, he was just coming to them with La ilaha illallah. Now we're going to all of Yemen and we're coming with an entire religion, right? This is a complete way of life at this point that has rules and regulations and disciplines that the people have to get accustomed uh, to. But now it, it gets really beautiful. Abu Musa continues the narration. And Abu Musa and Mu'ad at some point are traveling together. And Abu Musa was famous for reciting the Qur'an throughout the journey. The man never stops reading Qur'an. He reads Qur'an when he's riding, he reads Qur'an when he's standing, he's constantly doing muraja, he's constantly reviewing and reciting the Qur'an in that beautiful voice. So Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, كَيْفَ تَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنَ Oh Abu Musa, how is it that you read the Qur'an? What's your, what's your regimen like? So he said, قَائِمًا وَقَاعِدًا وَعَلَى رَاحِلَتِهِ uh, وَعَلَى رَاحِلَتِهِ That I read it standing, I read it sitting, I read it even when I am riding. He says that sometimes I read it in piecemeal and sometimes I read it all together, but I'm always reading the Qur'an. That this is my life. My life is the recitation of the Qur'an, right? And Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, أَمَّا أَنَا and so it's, it's interesting when you have these famous statements and you get the context. He said, Mu'ad says, as for me, he said, look, I don't read it as much. I read, but I also go to sleep at night. I take breaks, but I seek the reward from Allah of my sleeping, just as I seek the reward from Allah of my standing up in prayer. Meaning it's all part of that reward that we seek because it's all for the sake of Allah the sleeping and the waking up, but it sort of shows you how Abu Musa was عنه, with the Qur'an when he was traveling and in any place, anytime you're around the man, he's reciting the Qur'an. And in fact, you find in every city that he went to, and we're going to talk a little bit about where he would establish himself in different parts of the world uh, in his lifetime, every city that he went to, he basically taught everyone Qur'an. And his habit was the following. When he would go to a place, he would, after Salat al-Dhuhr, after the Dhuhr prayer, he would ask, is there anyone who wants to learn the Qur'an? And then he'd teach people the Qur'an, usually until Asr, and sometimes if there were people left over, he'd stay all the way until Maghrib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So that's something we take from him. He wasn't just trying to sit there and recite and have people talk about how beautiful his recitation was. He would ask, does anyone want to learn the Qur'an? And he'd recite between Dhuhr and Asr, teaching the people the Qur'an. And the one advice we have specific to, ha to him from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Muslim Imam Ahmad is, Oh Abu Musa, keep teaching the people the Qur'an when he sent to Yemen. Don't stop teaching people the Qur'an. So the man is a walking Qur'an, who recites the Qur'an in a way that no one has ever heard, and who teaches the people the Qur'an constantly, which shows you the hadith of the Prophet وعلمه. The best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and then teach it. So many people do the first part, right? We're, we're trying to produce mass hifad, right? Hifad, 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 hifad. Let's memorize, memorize, memorize. But how many people could you be teaching the Qur'an? Find a person that doesn't know how to read yet and say, look, I want to dedicate some time to you and teach you how to read a little bit. Let me teach you how to read the, with, with tajweed. Let me teach you how to read. Think about the blessing of that. And if we think we're too big for that, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was not too big for that. 
this grand companion after Dhuhr says, who wants to learn Qur'an? Let me teach you. And that's for brothers and sisters. You think about you know, sisters teaching other sisters, especially people that convert to Islam, brothers teaching brothers. Can I teach you Qur'an? Do you need help learning how to read? Or if you know some of the explanations, go over the explanation, the young and the old as well. And so this was his habit, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And of course, uh, anyone that lived under the time of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu has a special relationship with him in this regard. Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, every time he used to see Abu Musa, he used to say to him, the kirna ya Abu Musa. Remind us, O Abu Musa. Remind us, O Abu Musa. And Abu Musa radiallahu anhu would start reading the Quran to Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and Umar would sit and listen, and it was as if he wasn't here anymore. Now you think about that relationship. The kirna ya Abu Musa. Can you remind us, O Abu Musa? And imagine sitting with him and he as he starts to recite the Quran over and over and over again. He was also a great warrior, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was instrumental in many of the battles under Umar radiallahu anhu with Asbahan, Nahawan, Tustar, all of these places. And Umar radiallahu anhu appointed him as an Amir, first in Basra, and then later on he would be appointed to Al-Kufa under Uthman radiallahu anhu. So Al-Iraqain, the two Iraqs at the time. And when he was in Basra, uh, when he used to stand up and pray at night, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, that the people would surround the house of Abu Musa at night and they'd listen to him recite in his Qiyam al So imagine he gets to Basra, and when he's in Basra, everyone's crowding his house at night to listen to him recite the Qur'an. And when Umar radiallahu anhu asked Anas radiallahu anhu about him, قَالَ كَيْفَ تَرَكْتَ الْأَشْعَرِي How did you leave Abu Musa al-Ash'ari? قَالَ تَرَكْتُهُ يُعَلِّمُ النَّاسِ الْقُرْآنِ I left him and he's teaching people Qur'an, just like you thought. Right? The governor is also teaching the people the Qur'an in Basra. And Umar radiallahu anhu says, Ama innahu kayis, what an intelligent man he is. Like what a good man he is. And you know, all these weeks we've been talking about how rough Umar radiallahu anhu was on his governors and like how he'd rotate people around because he didn't want anyone to have uh, too much power over the people. One of the things that Umar radiallahu anhu did with Abu Musa that he did with no one else, that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, said that I don't give people more than a year in one location. But he says, as for uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, give him four years there. Give him four years there. So he had a specific love and a trust, and he saw a wisdom and a benefit, particularly to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu being in Basra for uh, longer than the governors that he would appoint in different places. And Abu Musa basically turns that place into a city of Qur'an radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And his son, Abi Burda, says that when he uh, left al-Basra, he only had 600 dirhams. Like he left a poor man, that post of governor of Basra for four years. And that was the fear that Umar had, is bribery and, and you know, governors becoming corrupt and, and emirs taking advantage of their people. So he left there with only 600 dirhams radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now one of the things that Abu Musa radiallahu anhu did was that he also lived to see the fitna, he lived to see uh, civil war break out and trials and tribulations. And he happens to be someone who narrates from the Prophet ﷺ many of the ahadith, many of the narrations about al-fitan, about the trials and tribulations. And so he narrated from the Prophet ﷺ, uh, مَنْ شَهَرَ عَلَيْنَا السِّلَاحِ فَلَيْسَ minna. Whoever uh, points a weapon at us is not from amongst us. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He also narrates the hadith man, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, who amongst the Muslims is best? And he said, مَنْ سَلِمَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ مِنْ نِسَانِهِ وَيَدِهِ The one from whom other Muslims feel safe from their tongue and from their hands. He's the one who narrates the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, المؤمن للمؤمن كالبنيان, that the believers to each other are like a building. Each part of that building reinforces the other. He narrates the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ said that when any one of you goes out of their home, do not let the, 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 the head of the arrow be exposed in a way that it could be pointed at one another. And Abu Musa radiallahu anhu said, oh, Wallahi, we did not court death until we saw the days that people started to intentionally fling those arrows, shoot those arrows at each other. So he hated the fitna. He hated to see trials and tribulations. He hated to see people that were fighting against one another. And so he was one of those people who would not participate in fighting against his brothers and sisters. Okay? And in fact, he is the famous arbitrator on behalf of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the, the, the battle of Safin. He is the one who's sent to actually uh, participate in arbitration. As Abu Musa radiallahu anhu is someone 
who does not want anything to do uh, with, with having that them, with having that sin on his back on the Day of Judgment. We find later on that uh, Muawiyah actually begged him to take a position when things settled down and he responded to Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he says that فَإِنَّكَ كَتَبْتَ إِلَيَّ فِي جَسِيمِ أَمْرِ الْأُمَّةِ that you have sent to me in regards to a huge affair as it concerns the Ummah and he says فَمَاذَا أَقُولُ لِرَبِّي إِذَا قَدِمْتُ عَلَيْهِ what will I say to my Lord when I see, when I'm sent back to him and I have to present on behalf of this affair that's been presented, that's been given to me and he says, so I have absolutely no need for this Wassalamu alaikum and peace be on to you. So I'm not interested in being a governor again. I'm not interested in being in charge again. I'm not interested in participating in the politics of the situation uh, again. And we also find a narration of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu going outside of his house in Damascus and Dimashq, listening to his qira'a at night and, uh, and enjoying the qiyam uh, that he had. Some of the other traits from this man, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, is that he was known to be a, an intercessor on behalf of the poor. So if someone is poor and someone is in debt and you can't pay it off yourself, then advocate for them. And he narrated something from the Prophet in that regard as well. So if you were poor or if you were in need and you went to him and he couldn't fulfill your need himself, then he would go radiallahu ta'ala anhu himself and he would argue on uh, your behalf. There's also a hadith where, uh, that we constantly quote. Abu Musa radiallahu anhu went to visit Al-Hasan ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhuma when he was sick. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu or Al-Hasan radiallahu ta'ala anhu said to him that are you coming to visit because of some need or is it for something else? He said, no, it's just for the sake of Allah. I'm just visiting a sick brother. So finding that time to visit someone who's sick. And that's when the narration comes that I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that no believer visits another believer except that they are accompanied by 70,000 of the malaika, 70,000 of the angels that are sending their peace and blessings upon him until the evening. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants that person a stream in Al-Jannah as well. So this is a hadith that's narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad as a result of a visit that a brother is paying to another brother at the time. Uh, he's also known to fast constantly radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And those of you that watched uh, Angels 2, there's an episode there called Abu Musa and the Sea. And I'll paraphrase it here because of the sake of time. That Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu was once traveling on a safina, on a boat with a bunch of people. And suddenly, there was a voice that cried out at sea, Ya Ahla Safina, O people of the ship, stop, as I will give you the news of a glad tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has placed upon himself. So the people looked around right and left, and they heard the voice seven times. And finally, Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Man ant, aina ant, who are you? Where are you from? Where are you? I can't hear you. And he said that the person then shouted out, or the voice then shouted out, Inna Allah qada ala nafsihi innahu man ta'attasha lillahi fi yawmin haar saqahu Allahu yawm al-atash. So the, the, the voice said that Allah has made a judgment upon himself that whoever experiences the thirst of fasting on a hot day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will nourish them on a day when people are dehydrated, when people need that, their thirst quenched more than any other day, which is the day of judgment. And Abu Musa radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, ever since that day, he said, I never missed fasting even on a hot day. And he narrates the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu in that regard of the virtue of fasting one day for the sake of Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we get close to his death, I wanted to mention another uh, narration about his du'a. So one of the things that you find about him radiallahu ta'ala anhu is that he used to make these beautiful du'as when he would uh, recite. And Masruq radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that one day we were traveling with Abu Musa and he stood up to pray Qiyam al-Layl and then he made this beautiful du'a. So this is when he's in his older age. And he said, Allahumma anta al-mu'min tuhibbu al-mu'min wa anta al-muhaymin تحب المهيمن وأنت السلام تحب السلام اللهم أنت المؤمن أو الله you are المؤمن المؤمن of course in regards to Allah سبحانه وتعالى 
Allah Azza wa Jal is the protector and you love Al-Mu'min, the believer. وَأَنْتَ الْمُهَيْمِنْ تُحِبُّ الْمُهَيْمِنْ And you are the guardian and you love the one who is a guardian. But a guardian of what? Right? In our situation, when a person becomes a guardian of their own faith, وَأَنْتَ salam, And you are peace and you love peace. تُحِبُّ salam. And that was one of the beautiful narrations about him. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ And when he was passing away, he actually uh, was fainting and he was uh, in the, uh, the lap of his wife, uh, Umm Abdullah bint Abi Duma radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he told her that I am free from those who would, who would wail or who would uh, shave their heads or tear their clothes and beware of the actions that cause harm to the deceased. So he was telling her, please, you know, as she's crying, not to do too much, not to wail, not to act in a way that the Prophet would not be pleased with. And he passes away radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the lap of his wife. And he passed away at the age of 63 years old, which was the same age as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he passed away uh, in the month of Dhul Hijjah, in the year 44. And Imam Al-Dhahabi Rahimahullah, he says about Abu Musa, uh, you know, commenting on his biography. He says, قَدْ كَانَ أَبُو مُوسَى صَوَّامًا قَوَّامًا رَبَّانِيًّا زَاهِدًا عَابِدًا مِمَّنْ جَمَعَ الْعِلْمَ وَالْعَمَلَ وَالْجِهَادَ وَالسَّلَامَةِ الصَّدْرِ that Abu Musa radiallahu anhu was one who was distinguished by his fasting, distinguished by his prayer, distinguished by the, uh, the way that he was, he was devout and his asceticism and his, uh, you know, his ability in battle, the way he used to struggle in battle, and salamat al-sadr, the way he didn't hold any ill feelings towards any other person, the purity of his heart. And he says, لَمْ تُغَيِّرْهُ الْإِمَارَ وَلَا اخْتَرَّ بِالدُّنْيَا that Leadership did not change him, nor was he ever deluded by the material things of this world. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so he leaves behind a great legacy, and there are hundreds of ahadith that are narrated from this man. Almost all of them have his children to some extent linked to it. And so the majority of the ahadith from Abu Musa are narrated by his son, Abil Burda. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with Abu Musa and his family. Allahumma ameen. Inshallah Ta'ala, as I said, uh, we're going to be covering over the next three weeks, Inshallah Ta'ala, uh, the short biographies of those that were there with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Hijrah. We ask Allah to be pleased with all of the companions of our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to join us with them. And may Allah allow us to hear the voice of Abu Musa reciting the Quran in Jannah. Say Ameen. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. Ameen. Uh, I'll take maybe two questions Inshallah Ta'ala and then we'll go for Salah. So.